Hello everyone and welcome to what is actually going to be the last uh, online event of our summer term at the Centre of Yoga Studies. Um, for anyone who isn't familiar with us, we are an academic centre at SOAS University in London, um, aiming to disseminate um, all of the kind of interesting and uh, excellent research that's going on, not just at SOAS, but also all around the world. Um, so we've had over the last few months speakers from a variety of different institutions talking about um, just a, a really fascinatingly wide range of subjects to do with yogic studies. So if you haven't caught those, you can catch up on our YouTube channel. So just um, search for SOAS Centre of Yoga Studies on YouTube and you'll find it there. Um, this event is also being recorded for our YouTube channel, which will in include the questions as well at the end. Um, so as I said, um, this is the last event of our summer term, but we will be having a new programme starting in September. So make sure that you're following us on Instagram or Facebook or even on our newsletter um, to make sure that you hear about those when they happen. Um, if you just Google SOAS Centre of Yoga Studies, you'll find our webpage, which has details of how to sign up for each of those things. Um, I think that's most of the housekeeping. The final thing to say is that um, we are managing the Q&A through Slido. So you should have had a link to that in the Eventbrite email that came today. Um, but if not, go and um, double, double check that. And um, that is the, the only way that we're kind of managing questions. But if you put your own name to it, then we will be able to call on you to actually ask the question live. If you prefer to be anonymous, then I'll read them out as chair today. So um, uh, my name is Martha Henson. I'm the coordinator at the Centre of Yoga Studies and I'm going to be chairing today's event. Um, but I'm also uh, about to hand over to our speaker, who I'm very pleased that we've been able to get back. Um, we had her um, due to come in March, but unfortunately had to cancel due to COVID. Um, so I'm really glad we've got another opportunity to welcome her. So. Um, uh, she, uh, our speaker today is going to be Magdalena Kraler, based at um, the University of Vienna. She's a PhD student, uh, PhD candidate, sorry, there in the um, uh, Department of Religious Studies. Um, actually comes from a very interesting practitioner background. She has an MA in uh, music and dance education and is interested in the sort of crossover areas between physical and religious practice uh, in modern yoga, but also physical culture and dance. And uh, today she's going to be telling us about her research into pranayama. So, Lena, I will hand over to you. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Martha, for introducing me and, for, and to the Center of Yoga Studies for having me here tonight. I'm really excited to be talking to you. And, um, okay, as um, Martha has, in, um, has indicated, I am a PhD student and my overall work is on uh, pranayama or yogic breath cultivation and <clears throat> everything that I'm going to present here tonight is part of my doctoral research. And um, I'm quite well advanced in my research. I'm in the writing up phase of my PhD thesis and um, there is um, a, an article ready um, which is also called the, the Pranayama Grid, but it is not yet published. Um, um, so, um, so I just want to make clear that this is not yet in a state of peer-reviewed research, but it's going, it's on the way and it's, I hope it will be published soon. Just uh, before I start, I have to do one more thing. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, to uh, share my slides with you now. Just a second. Okay, I think you're going to see my slides fine now. Is it, is it fine? Okay, good. So, um, I think many of you know that pranayama is a very a highly relevant set of practice for both pre-modern yoga and modern yoga. And, um, but it, it did not receive the scholarly attention so far that it actually needs to receive. And this talk will address the problem of the polysemic notion of pranayama. And um, I will be providing a structure for not only talking about the practice, but themselves, but also um, the cultural settings that engender the practices. And, um, and in order to do so, I have created a grid, what I call the pranayama grid. 
um, that aims to, to delineate the main cultural settings and in order to uh, place the practice in these um, cultural settings, I, I, hand, I operate with the grid that delineates the main poles of the, uh, uh, of the discourses through which, um, so the main uh, pole through which um, the discourses run. And uh, so the grid is um, designed to analyze modern yogic breath cultivation between 1850 and 1940. So that's the time frame of my historical study that I'm working with. And obviously I'm not going to, um, um, to um, show a full development between in this time frame, but throw spotlights on various seminal developments. And I will start um, by giving a brief outline of pre-modern pranayama practice and understanding of prana. And then I will outline uh, the pranayama grid and um, I will give uh, two major examples within the grid that are very relevant for um, pranayama developments. And I will then continue to introduce two um, highly important modern yoga um, pioneers which are Swami Vivekananda and Swami Kuvalyananda. And I will juxtapose their understanding of prana and pranayama. Okay, so I have already indicated that a little bit, that um, prana and pranayama become highly uh, polyvalent, polysemic notions in modern yoga. And so, the, so pranayama becomes kind of a container um, for various practices like um, deep breathing, rhythmic breathing, alternate nostril breathing, or also various forms, of course, of kumbhaka or breath retention. And all of these, um, all of these practices are in more or less close uh, association or identification with pranayama. So I apply the term yogic breath cultivation for all the practices that can be grouped around pranayama. I speak of pranayama only when a respective author refers to the practice as pranayama in order to make a definition um, between the core practices and the associated practices or a distinction between these terms. And um, so for example, if Sri Yogendra, an important yoga pioneer uses our movements to enhance clavicular breathing, which is upper chest breathing, um, this is clearly influenced um, by gymnastic practices that came in from the Euro-American discourses and both re with regard to the terminology of the practice clavicular breathing, um, but also the type of exercise. But he does treat it as part of his pranayama teaching. So that's why I use uh, yoga breath cultivation as a bigger, larger umbre umbrella. Okay, moving on to pre-modern context. Um, in pre-modern yoga, pranayama has deep roots in Indian religious traditions. So there is a huge cultural and religious baggage that accompanies the practice. And most of it, it is relevant also for modern yogic breath cultivation. Um, pranayama is generally translated as breath control. The compound is prana and ayama. And here prana is mostly understood as breath. And ayama is understood as control, retention, or in tantric contexts, even extension. The tricky part is that prana can also be translated in a wider sense um, as vital principle or vital air. So breath, breath as a um, universal principle, the breath of life, which is also often handled as a synonym. And, um, but prana can also mean in its narrow sense breath or even more narrow, just out breath. Um, so as one of the five pranas, it would signify as the first of the five pranas, it would be out breath only. Um, at times prana is also in Upanishadic context, for example, um, equated with Brahman. So you see how um, Indian religious contexts provide it like a, um, numerous associ associations with prana that are then also um, made available for modern yoga contexts. And thus even the term pranayama becomes more difficult to grasp because what is it actually that we control during pranayama? Is it 
breath, individual breath? Is it individual mind? Is it, um, is it life at large or is it the macrocosm through the microcosm as Vivekananda suggests? So I will go into some of these questions later. Um, in terms of the pre-modern practice, pranayama, so I will just address the most salient points, um, is the fourth limb in Patanjali Yoga. And uh, the Yoga Sutra says that pranayama removes the obscuration of light and the practitioner becomes, the yogi becomes fit for dharana. And um, in, in Hatha Yoga, uh, pranayama became mostly synonymous with kumbhaka, uh, which is uh, the phase of the breath that lies during inhalation and exhalation. Um, and its breath retention. And so the meaning of pranayama was pretty much narrowed down in Hatha Yoga to breath retention. Um, nevertheless, there were preliminary purposes of pranayama um, that were most importantly cleansing of nadis, uh, which are the subtle channels in which prana flows. And this was called nadi shodhana or nadi shuti. So it's not it's not, it's not always clear if Nadi Shodhana is the result of the practice or the practice itself. But in any case, it is a preliminary practice to pranayama as kumbhaka. And Nadi Shodhana in most cases meant alternate nostril breathing. And this is often um, combined with visualization techniques and also kumbhaka, but it is um, in a different sense than the, eight, the defined eight kumbhakas, which are often found in Hatha Yoga texts. Okay, it's important to note that pranayama in medieval Hatha Yoga had tremendous soteriological potential, which means liberation potential. It is often said to directly induce moksha if one masters pranayama. And so that makes it highly relevant in the context of religion. Um, but I do consider that it is also had therapeutic potential. So the text described that certain types of prana, pranayama you do reduce inflammation, destroy warmth in the body, um, balances the three doshas, um, reduce inflammation in a given part of the body. So it's obvious that there is therapeutic, there are therapeutic utilizations too. And another uh, important point of departure for my study of yogic breath cultivation, I want to address briefly that uh, moving on to modern yoga contexts, many scholars in the field, including myself, hold that modern yoga was influenced by the transnational physical culture movement. So transnational national really means Euro-American, but that swept over to India and from there, there and back. So it's an intercultural exchange happening. And also similarly important agents of the occult networks um, like the most importantly the Theosophical Society had an important role to play um, in shaping modern yoga practices but particularly the ideas that often lie behind yogic breath cultivation are highly occultized and so all these contextual networks are transnational networks um, and that's something that I would encourage you to keep in mind while we go through the talk. Okay, I will now move on to what I call the pranayama grid and I explain how it works. And um, so this work builds on several modern yoga scholars and scholars of religion before me. But the way I put it together, the axis of the grid, which I will introduce shortly, um, is innovative and it is uh, particularly innovative in, in terms of applying it to um, specific, specifically to uh, pranayama practice, to yogic breath cultivation in a wider sense and to the cultural networks in which it, play, it is placed. Um, as, modern, as, as Mark Singleton has pointed out, modern yoga unfolds between the poles of religion and physical culture. And between these poles, there is a continuum or a spectrum of practices. And this is also true regarding the goals of practices, this continuum or spectrum. So I consider this to be more of a horizontal co coordinate in the sense of a synchronic timeline. Uh, because in modern yoga practices, religion and physical, physical culture contexts are often commingled in one and the same practice or one and the same author. So they, um, this axis kind of moves 
through the timeline and is um, more or less relevant in any given yoga pioneer, but a yoga pioneer might address more the, the one coordinate or the, or the other or both simultaneously. And, but in any case, they are not mutually exclusive. Um, the term religion here signifies uh, or implies influential religious currents, which are the theory and practice of the yoga traditions, um, but also Advaita related movements, like in the case of Vivekananda, Hindu ritual practices, which I will go into soon, and 19th century, century occultism, which is transnational. And to some extent, this uh, axis religion and physical culture also mirrors the spectrum of pre-modern yoga, Hatha yoga, with regard to the practice that was both, as I said, health oriented, oriented but also religiously oriented. And on the other hand, physical culture is a transnational network. So mainly when I talk about physical culture in the grid, I mean that transnational Euro-American discourses. And, and that includes gymnastics, um, medical gymnastics, most importantly, the Linksys, Swedish link system, and American delsartism as the most important um, strands that I consider. Um, and American delsartism also includes the cultiv cultivation of movement and voice and expression through movement and voice. So, you, so there, is an, there is an emphasis on Euro-American discourses that lie, lie at the base of what is generally understood as, um, as physical culture movement. As a second axis, I will present a vertical axis, which is tradition and innovation. And so it's vertical because tradition tends to reach back into a historical past. So I mean, by vertical, I mean it's diachronic because tradition tends to reach into a historical past and innovation tends to push forwards. And, um, but I do consider this axis mainly as relevant in terms of how yoga pioneers would appeal to tradition. So not so much in the sense of actual tradition, which is of course also there, so there is an actual yoga tradition that has grown over centuries in India. But the way how um, uh, modern yoga pioneers activate that tradition, how they relate to it as an unbroken chain of um, history um, with no gaps and no cracks is, um, is a highly imaginative approach to tradition because there, as we see in modern yoga, there are huge gaps. Um, and, and cracks, and they happen also in the 18th and seven, in the 19th and 18th century. And so, for example, how yoga pioneers would invoke Patanjali and Hatha Yoga in one as one lineage, or also Vivekananda's references to the mythical founder of Sankhya school, uh, Kapila, that he invokes as a tradition um, relevant point to relate in terms of tradition. And also in contemporary yoga, you will see how um, practitioners and yeah, scholars, hopefully not so much histori historian scholars, um, to tradition as, as unbroken chain of tradition. And so this access was established also by Olaf Hammer in his seminar Claiming Knowledge, but he did not introduce it in terms of modern yoga research. Um, and tradition and innovation are frequent, frequently combined in the work of one and the same author, as we will see. So they might have a traditionalistic understanding of pranayama, but try to explain it in a contemporary medical, scientific jargon, etc. We will see ex examples of that. Okay, I will now introduce a category that I call catalysts, and these are three. And these are called catalysts because they um, push modern yoga developments. They um, push it on a transnational scale. They, they accelerate the developments. And first of all, I introduce scientific discourse. And, but it's important to note that science in these discourses and at this time meant a scaled down fragmented image of science that is often or heavily oriented towards experience. So it's a basic empirical understanding of science on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's appeal to science, which is often found in occultism to, for example, explain metaphysical concepts 
and compare it with the concept of evolution and make these kind of links that make um, them seem to be on the same plane. As Joseph Alter has observed, um, um, many, a variety of Sanskritic terms like vidya, vidyana, and I would add also shastra have been translated as science, especially in theosophical context, but also in early modern yoga. And, um, okay, so far so good. And another catalyst is nationalism as an answer to the overpowering uh, force of of the British in colonial India. And the third one is media culture, but more specifically the influence of translations of Sanskrit, Sanskrit texts again by Indian theosophists and the av availability of these texts and modern, modern yoga manuals through print media. But today I will uh, only focus on the cat catalyst of scientific discourse. And with some precaution, we can attach science to the category of innovation because pranayama is increasingly explained in medical terms or in some authors, the aspect of science is the main innovative drive. Um, but ultimately it is not possible to ascribe science a fixed place within the grid. The cate category of science is more of a movable ca category because um, in the Brahma Samaj, which is a Hindu reform movement in um, Bengal in the 19th century invokes um, Patanjali as science or the yoga of Patanjali as science. So we see that tradition partly is associated with science also. And so is um, also the Brahma Samaj identified Hindu religion as a scientific religion that was apparently um, superior to Christianity that was considered to be more irrational had no ideas of evolution and that kind. So uh, religion is also can be associated with science. And then physical culture was propelled by its appeal to science too, because systems of exercise were analyzed by medical approaches to science, which is of course relevant also for modern yoga. Okay, within this uh, outline, I will now focus on um, the aspect of religion. And I do that by highlighting what I call 19th century prayer books. And um, we, because it was also called prayer book um, by the field itself. And behind this um, lies the, I, the description of Sandhya practice, which is um, a Vedic practice. Um, so it, re, it goes back before BCE and it's um, Sandhya means a juncture between dusk, uh, day and night. So it's dusk worship at dusk and dawn. And the core practice of Sandhya is um, the recitation of the Gayatri Mantra. But over, in, over the course of time, several practices like um, bowing to, the, to four directions, the sipping of water um, and pranayama became imp incorporated within Sandhya practice. And so, in, so all the prepar all the preliminary practices that include pranayama, that includes pranayama, were there to purify the person before re reciting the Gayatri Mantra. And, um, okay, and these ritual actions were depicted first in English, probably first time by um, the ethnographer Belnos, so um, in her 1851 book, and here you see how that she um, depicts alternate nostril breathing on the slide. And so alternate nostril breathing is inhaling through one nostril, exhaling through the other, and then vice versa. And um, she describes it in term, in, with the Sanskrit terms, uh, here probably a Bengali transliteration, um, kumbhaka, rechaka, and puraka for retention. Um, exhalation and inhalation. And it's important to know that alternate nostril breathing could be part, obviously part of Sandhya practice, but um, there are also other forms of pranayama that would be uh, described in prayer books. And uh, 25 years later, there's a highly influential tract by the Hindu reformer, Dayananda Saraswati. So he was the founder of the Arya Samaj movement that spread all over India. 
<clears throat> and found and there were several sub-samajas that were nevertheless attached to the Arya Samaj. And Saraswati wrote Satya Prakash, in which he also described Sandhya as a relevant practice for the three upper cases, um, of three upper varnas. And, um, and also he, he recommends to women to practice um, Sandhya too, which is, was really innovative. And he also describes uh, various preliminary practices, including um, pranayama, which he also correlates in there with um, the Eightfold Path of Patanjali. So there is a kind of an overlap of Sandhya practice and Patanjali here. And he does not describe ultimate nostril breathing, but a simple, simple form of breath cultivation that is um, inhalation, retention, exhalation with the focus on, on the retention. And again, he explains it as a form of expiation by quoting from the Manusmriti, um, so a, a purification from sins. And after um, Dayananda, who was related um, in his early work with the Theosophists, so he collaborated with the Theosophists, also influenced Theosophical discourse, and one of the Theosophists that followed him in regard of uh, his understanding of Sandhya is Ratan Chand Bari, who wrote um, another prayer book of the Aryans, as he called it, um, that also describes pranayama in a very similar mode as Dayananda Saraswati. So I want to highlight this because I think it's important to see how disseminated forms of pranayama um, were in Hindu ritual culture, which was disseminated all over India and also through various varnas, which are is often translated as castes. Um, and that is an important background um, fertile floor of um, modern yogic breath cultivation because, um, because it also informed modern yoga pioneers um, and it inf informed the practitioner, the Indian practitioners had an, uh, like, I think often a daily experience of pranayama practice. Okay, I will now move on to um, describing um, the first correlation and description of pranayama in medical and scientific terms. And very likely this was um, accomplished by the Bengali physician Novin Chandapal in his um, a treatise on the yoga philosophy, which was first published also like Belnus's book in 1851 and later republished by the Theosophists in 1882. And Paul was familiar with a wide range of yoga literature, but also of medical literature that came in from Euro-American discourses and including scientific treatises, for example, on respiration, um, which included the Germans, uh, Karl von Vierort, study on the physiology of respiration. And so Fiorot described um, breathing in terms of um, carbon dioxide data that he gained from his self experiments. And um, N.C. Paul was familiar with this. So he knew the chemical element carbon dioxide and other elements that, and the carbon dioxide as relevant for respiration. And he correlates carbon dioxide CO2 with pranayama and yogic practice. So for him, the deciding factor of yogic practice was the reduction of CO2. He says that everything what a yogi does, um, the food, the clothing, the habitat, the practice, and especially pranayama practice helps to reduce the CO2 and the outbreath. So you can see here that for him, and he explicitly says that for him, prana means outbreath. Um, in a, so prana in its narrowest sense. So once the yogi would reduce that to a minimum extent, he is able to hibernate like animals, which is an important theme in this treatise. And therefore he would be able to be buried alive and survive being buried alive and resurrect kind of after 40 days or more. So he describes case studies and he was apparently eyewitness to one of these case studies too. And he, Paul himself, did not um, perform CO2 experiments on himself, himself, but he relies on the data derived from Karl von Fjord's study. 
Um, Paul further describes yoga, and this is important, um, as the art of suspending the circulation and respiration. So suspending the respiration is essentially kumbhaka. And this is crucial because it's a definition of yoga and implicitly pranayama in medical and physiological terms. Um, and this is implicitly also relevant for pranayama because for uh, Paul, all the higher states of Patanjala yoga like Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi are just prolonged kumbhaka. So the longer the kumbhaka lasts, the, um, it, so you, the higher the grade of the, patan, the Eightfold Path you attain. And so summing up, what is really crucial here is the definition of yoga and pranayama in medical terms and their theory of CO2 reduction as the main axis of yogic practice and pranayama. So that is uh, really innovative in Paul, but Paul also had important informants. Um, and one of them was um, James Braid, who wrote, um, who was the inf inventor of, of, or rather the popularizer of hypnotism. In his observations on trance or human hibernation from 1850, um, Braid parallels what he calls yogic hibernation with his technique of hypnosis. So he also observed that the breathing and heart rate during yogic hibernation and hypnosis went down. But he did not specifically apply this observation either to pranayama or talk about CO2 reduction in the outbreath, as Paul does. Okay, Paul's treatise became influential through the reception of the Theosophists in 1882 which was published again in the Theosophist and then again in book form. And the recept the, at the same time, the reception by the Theosophists also indicates their appeal to connect um, science and religion, which um, is dealt with in Paul's treatise. And that leads us to, um, to ultimately an occult interpretation of science, which, which I will go into now. Okay, so um, occult interpretation of science is best described or highlighted by the phrase, by addressing the phrase, the science of breath in terms of your breath cultivation, of course. So the science of breath um, really combines <clears throat> the influence of yogic breath cultivation or also tantric influence, but also occult interpretations of science. And the first person who probably coined the uh, um, phrase, the science of breath, was the theosophist Rama Prasad. And so Rama Prasad translated the um, a tantric text, the Shiva Svarodaya, um, from the Sanskrit into English. And the Shiva Svarodaya describes a practice in which um, breath is observed flowing in the nostrils. And this is called Svara. So this kind of um, breath flow is called svara, and based on that, there are, the yogi or tantric practitioner is able to observe um, the state of his health or uh, his near death or prevent death, etc., etc. So it's divinative. The purpose is divination and also health oriented. And um, and this phrase became highly influential, as we see in the other publications like. Um, uh, Yogi Ramacharaka, the Hindu Yogi Science of Breath, and Swami Shivananda's Science of Pranayama. <clears throat> but it's important to see that um, this understanding of science delineates um, actually a yogic or tantric practice, and it was probably the tantric and uh, the theosoph theosophical backgrounds to show to that highlight the term science and correlated with the translation in these texts, with the translation of these texts. Okay. Briefly revisiting the pranayama grid, we have touched so far upon the aspects of scientific discourse, also um, in terms of occultism, but uh, we have also talked about Hindu ritual practices, which I highlight, Santya. 
um, but also about yoga traditions um, that were relevant for both um, Dayananda Sarasvati and also for um, N.C. Paul, uh, especially Patanjali Yoga. Okay, most of what we have discussed now our early modern yoga discourses before Vivekananda. And as many of you know, Vivekananda was highly influential for um, uh, modern yoga before the turn of the century. And most of what we have said is also directly relevant of, for Vivekananda's notion and understanding of prana and pranayama. Um, Vivekananda was born and raised in Tantric Bengal. And in the cosmo cosmopolitan capital Calcutta, he actively engaged in various religious and cultural strands that commingled in Calcutta in the late 19th century. And towards the end of his short life, he became an iconic figure of Hinduism, Vedanta, and yoga on a global scale. So, because he was um, also um, performing um, and teaching in the West. He was a member of the influential Hindu reform movement, Brahma Samaj, and he was a devotee and a disciple of the tantric, uh, tantric sage uh, Ramakrishna. So um, Vivekananda was also influenced by Kala, Kali or Kali worship in a tantric setting. And I think his thought was also rooted in vernacular Advaita movements, evidenced by the fact, for example, that Vivekananda had read the Yoga Vasishta, which is an early medieval non-dual work of Shaiva Tantra. And he read it in Bengali and English. So um, in Bengali, I stress in Bengali because it showed it was a, probably a highly disseminated um, text at his time. And I won't go into the reception of this text by Vivekananda, but I think it, the text was quite influential for Vivekananda. And um, in Vivekananda's thought, the term prana is highly polyvalent, which is nothing new as we have seen in Indian history. And he, so he on the one hand deeply roots it in Indian traditions. And so he, he often outlines prana as a cosmic principle or life force, life principle, and force in its broadest sense. And he mostly couples this with the Sanskrit term akasha, which is, um, can be translated as space, sky. But for Vivekananda, it was mostly ether and matter that were the most relevant translations. And these principles could, for Vivekananda, could be resolved back into one, which is Purusha and Brahman for Vivekananda. Purusha or Brahman, I should say. Um, in his famous Raja Yoga lectures held in the US in 1895 and 96, Vivekananda says that prana constitutes all existence together with akasha. So in its tangible form, prana becomes, quote, um, everything that we call energy, everything that we call force, motion, gravitation, magnetism. So that is the macrocosmic part of his interpretation of prana. And I will go on, quote, breath in the human body, it's breath, nerve currents and thought force. So that is the microcosmic part of his interpretation of prana. But the two, as we shall see, are correlated. And <clears throat> uh, Vivekananda's equation of prana as force and akasha as matter, which he sometimes makes very explicit, also reflects 19th century discourses on scientific materialism that Vivekananda clearly tries to allude to here. And this is ultimately an occult interpretation of Prano and Akasha because we find similar correlations before him in, um, in theosophical texts, for example, in Rama Prasad's Occult Science of Breath. Okay, another important angle is Vivekananda's correlation of Prana and the mind. And again, an axis that goes back to Upanishadic thought. His Raja Yoga, which means kingly yoga, is a set of techniques that is designed to train and control the mind. Consequently, pranayama is also a technique for him to control the mind. And to this end, he suggests to start with the body with the tangibility of the breath. So pranayama stands at the beginning of Raja Yoga, but also at its end since it's highly potent. And through the lens of prana and pranayama, Vivekananda attempts to explain various phenomena in the material world and the control of prana results in the yogi's omnipotence. So, um, so he stretches 
um, the notion of prana as well as pranayama in order to explain, to give a, a framework for explaining various phenomena. And I will give two examples here. Quote, you will find that wherever there is any extraordinary display of power, it is the manifestation of this prana. Even the physical sciences can be included in pranayama. What moves the steam engine? Prana acting through the steam. What are all, the, all these phenomena of electricity and so forth but prana? What is physical science? It's the science of pranayama by external me means. Prana manifesting itself as mental power can only be controlled by mental means, which is Raja Yoga. So you can see how he uses his white term to, of prana to also stretch the meaning of pranayama. Thus the science of pranayama, note the phrase, becomes physical science by external means. And Raja Yoga, and this is text opposed to Raja Yoga, which is the technique to control mental power. And he, wow, it's heavily raining right now. <laughs> um, and he continues to, uh, with these sort of uh, these strong correlations. Quote, this opens to us the door to almost unlimited power. Suppose for instance, um, a man understood the prana perfectly and could control it. What power on earth would not be his? He would be able to move the sun and stars out of their place, to control everything in the universe from the atoms to the biggest suns because he would control the prana. This is the end and aim of pranayama. I think it's pretty clear that Vivekananda's understanding of pranayama is city oriented and so he promises the attainment of magical powers through the connection between the microcosm and the macrocosm. And as Niall Green has pointed out in his pioneer, pioneering study, Breathing in India, the correlation of prana and power or prana and powers is highly prominent in Vivekananda's thought. <clears throat> and Vivekananda's subtext here is arguing against the overpowering force of colonialism. And many of his lectures held in the West have this, um, this drive of um, showing ultimate supremacy over the West. So he's basically saying that physical science is external science, and, but Raja Yoga is internal science that, that is ultimately superior to all the steam engines developed in the West. So I will not go further into um, these nationalistic implications, but um, this could be also, as pointed out, analyzed within the grid. When Vivekananda talks about pranayama, he means alternate nostril breathing. This is, basic, this is the basic practice that he describes in detail, and it's only alternate nostril breathing. And I would say that his sole focus on alternate nostril breathing is a fragment of ritualistic pranayama, as I have shown, it was, a, um, it was a highly disseminated technique in India. And um, so this is evident in when Swami Vivekananda, for example, in a, in a lecture held in England, says, um, what is the best time for practice in yoga? The junction time of dawn and twilight. <clears throat> so that points towards Sandhya. And um, he then continues with something that is not uh, derived from Sandhya. He says, um, mentally hold the body as perfect, part by part, and then send a current of love all around the world. And this is followed by witnessing the breath and alternate nostril breathing. So that's the context in which um, alternate nostril breathing is set. And so the last um, sentence meant to mentally hold the body as perfect um, is very likely an influence of American New Thought on Vivekananda, which he was familiar with through his travels and, and probably also through his reading history. And, um, and that new, American New Thought um, often applies affirmations to strengthen the body-mind system and to and so that is an example for such an affirmation. And it, I think it's quite typical for Vivekananda to access his audience, which was in England, with a familiar set of um, thought that they, were, that they could access the practice. So I think he was very good in um, shaping the practice according to his, and, and his talks according to his audiences. 
Okay, I will briefly locate, uh, review and locate um, Vivekananda within the grid. Um, so we saw that some um, aspects of Vivekananda's prana understanding are highly traditional. For example, the correlation of prana and the mind. Um, uh, and alternate nostril breathing as part of ritual settings, either Sandhya or um, it's also can also be part of tantric rituals as again as a purification before approaching a goddess, for example. So, um, so that are um, more traditional aspects of his um, approach. But then his correlation of prana and akasha in his cosmology and translation as force and matter points toward implicit reception of occultism, which was often a scientific understanding of these terms. And, and then to correlate alternate nostril breathing with new thought um, is again an innovative factor. And so you see how um, Vivekananda mainly moves in the context of religion, but there are traditional and innovative aspects and they coming also, they are not mutually exclusive. Okay, so uh, Vivekananda was highly important for modern yoga's dissemination. And I think especially for the concept of prana. So if you look at any contemporary um, pranayama manual, even today you will very likely find some allusion to his understanding of prana. And especially at prana of prana and power, or um, there are certain reverberations that would um, clearly come from Vivekananda. But he was also crit criticized within um, modern yoga context within the field. And I will, go, I will be introducing Swami Kuvayananda now, who was both a continuous, continuing but also opposing his legacy. Swami Kuvayananda established a laboratory and clinic for investing the, investigating the efficacy of yogic techniques in the 1920s. And he had learned uh, Indian physical culture from uh, his guru, Professor Man Manikrao, and he had learned yoga from his guru, uh, Madhav Dasti of Malsa, who was based at the Namada River. And supported by the Indian government, Kuvalyananda was able to establish an important and influential center for the medical study of yoga that is still in existence today between Bombay and Pune in Lonavla, and that's the Kaivalya Dhamma Yoga Institute. And so which I've visited last year also. Um, the Kaivalya Dhamma at Lonavla had many patients, students, and a pan-Indian appeal, and, and its quarterly journal, the Yoga Mimansa, was widely disseminated outside of India too. And um, and most importantly, many findings of the Kaivalya Dharma labs would be reverberated after Kuvalyananda by subsequent modern yoga pioneers who would use the data generated to exemplify the efficacy of yogic techniques, especially, um, for example, um, shoulder stand, and, but also so Sarvang Asana, but also in terms of Pranayama, this was an important source for subsequent yoga pioneers. In his book, Pranayama, from 1931, Kuvalyananda relies on Hatha yogic Pranayama techniques, which are the eight Kumbhakas, and for him also plus Kapala Bahati. And, and he also relies on Patanjali, and, and he says that Patanjali and his commentator, Vyasa, um, when they talk about prana, they mean breath and breath only. And Kuvalyananda knew Sanskrit, so that's his anal analysis of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. Um, and he states that, quote, even with authors of Hatha Yoga, the word pranayama as it occurs in the compound pranayama has only one meaning and it is breath. So I'm, and, and quote, I'm not here to determine whether he's right or not in this regard, but I think it's clear that for him prana um, never indicates any psychic force or cosmic element, which he also quotes like this statement was a quotation. Um, um, I think he really alludes to Vivekananda or to an occult interpretation of prana before him and implicitly, first implicitly to Vivekananda and then explicitly. And I will 
summarize this uh, quotation. So he says, Swami Vivekananda's lectures on Raja Yoga are full of interpretations of yogic things in the light of science. But at the end, he says, Swami Vivekananda never tried these <coughs> experiments and had to resort to speculation. So he says, this, this is only masterpieces of inspirational literature, end quote. And so according to the Swami, nobody was authorized for scientific statements or allusions to science unless they were proved by scientific experiments, which was the, the trait of Swami Kuvayananda. So um, what Kuvayananda did was that he explored um, pranayama and other techniques, but I will focus on pranayama in terms of, uh, for example, with um, x-rays that um, uh, analyzed how the ribs would move vis-a-vis -vis the diaphragm du during pranayama or before or after kumbhaka. He would analyze changes in blood pressure or changes in the intra, um, internal pressure changes within the chest cavity during and after pranayama and the heart, heart rate, um, et cetera, et cetera. So these are a few examples. And so here we see a, a person performing nauli, which is not specifically pranayama, but um, um, and associated techniques and uh, Kuvalyananda in the white beard. Okay, nevertheless, I think Kuvalyananda was in some ways less far opposed to Vivekananda as he probably wanted to be. Ultimately, his program was occult too, in a sense that it combined the factors of science and religion. And to make science serve the purpose of showing the efficacy of age old yoga. And I, this will become evident in this quote. He wanted to make the Western laboratory methods of research to reveal, reveal spiritual wonders. And spiritual wonders for him was related to Hatha yoga and Kundalini arousal. And so he, here you see how the appeal to sci innovation also touches upon the category of tradition. So I think there is a strong pull in Kuvalyananda's work between these poles of innovation and tradition that in a way propelled his scientific um, experiments and his overall work. But I think he was also, there is evidence that he was also highly challenged by this pull because it, it is not possible to, still not possible to reveal um, these spiritual wonders or to show Kundalini arousal in data at least at not at, at his time, I don't know about today. Okay, and Kuvalyananda's work is also interesting when we look at the religion, physical culture axis of the grid. Here you see the, his book, Pranayama cover, one version of, of a cover. And he says that yogic culture um, was divided into <clears throat> yogic physical culture and yogic spiritual culture. And he derives this understanding of yogic physical and spiritual culture from an interpretation of pre-modern pranayama practice of a means to, on the one hand, purify and strengthen and heal the yogi's body, and on the other hand, to um, use it as a soteriological, as a religious tool for liberation. And so he utilized this for his own work in the 20th century. And so the physical culturist would mainly pursue health and the spiritual culturist um, uh, goes for higher yogic um, aims like um, higher stages of Patanjala yoga, the perception of chakras and um, Kundalini arousal. In terms of yogic physical culture, um, there is also an influence of transnational physical culture in it. For example, the highly influential work of J.P. Müller and which uh, Kuvalyananda opposes, but he never, it, so you can find traces of this influence. Um, and only the spiritual culturist would learn the um, highly relevant technique of uh, Kumbhaka practice. So that, so Kumbhaka ultimately produces these higher stages of yoga in terms of Kuvalyananda's thought. And only the spiritual culturist would apply the Chalam um to and to give an example, um, Kapalabhati, uh, which is a practice where uh, that um, uses fast or rapid pushes from the lower ab abdomen to, to um, exhale um, frequently, like 
Um, so he says that uh, the physical culturist would practice this for physiological benefits, for oxygen consumption, and for pur purifying the nadis. And the yogic spiritual culturist uh, would gain uh, the perception of a serene light within the nerve plexuses, which are the chakra chakras, and eventually also kundalini arousal. Okay, I will, um, as a final step, I will um, locate Kuvalyananda within the grid and juxtapose it, pose it with Vivekananda. Um, so in Kuvalyananda's thought, tradition is appealed, um, is there by the appeal to um, Patanjali's re reading of Patanjali, for example, prana as breath only. But also um, the ultimate aim of uh, pranayama is kundalini arousal, which is relevant for the spiritual culturist. Um, but Kuvalyadanda, in the lineage of N.C. Paul, also performed a, um, a study on CO2 reduction during pranayama. So uh, what Paul described, Kuvalyadanda actually set into experiments. And so that is an innovative drive, but has, but within the N.C. Paul lineage, right? And um, he also um, refers to the highly relevant theme within physical culture of uh, breathing methods for oxygen consumption. And he ascribes this as a goal for the physical culturist. And I put these um, innovative aspects on the right side of the grid, on the physical culture side of the grid, because these were so also informing physical culture practices, for example, especially in terms of breath cultivation as enhancing oxygen consumption. And, and then also, of course, his innovative drive of um, x-rays and so all these methods to measure yogic techniques. And if we juxtapose this to Vivekananda, you can see how Kuvalyan and Namo touch, touches quite on every aspect of um, the grid, while um, Vivekananda mainly stays in the, as in the realm of religion. But there are some allusions to physical culture in Vivekananda too, but I did not introduce them. So there was no time for that. But I just want to say that as a, um, to give you a complete picture. And uh, in terms of their scientific appeal, so it is there in Vivekananda, as I have pointed out, but it is also highlighted more in, term, um, in terms of, in the work of Swami Kuvalyananda. Okay. Um, So summing up, we have dealt basically with two words, which um, in various interpretations, which are pra prana and pranayama. And I hope to have shown you how on the one hand, these terms are highly polyvalent, polysemic. So they have numerous interpretation throughout this um, time of the an an analysis. And on the other hand, I hope to show you how these diverse elements could be analyzed within the grid and, um, you know, to extract the, the meanings of, of, e and of each statement and locate it in a specific context, which could be um, Hindu ritual practices or um, N.C. Paul's lineage or physical culture's influence or the influence of theosophy, etc., etc. <clears throat> so, um, Finally, oops, I want to thank you very much for your attention for this subject and for this highly complex material, I think. Um, um, uh, so, as I said, there will be some articles await awaiting publication and <clears throat> please do check out my uh, Academia webpage in the following months. So it will be launching a few articles in uh, fall or one article in 2020 and then two or three articles in early 21. So um, I appreciate um, if you have a look. And uh, I, I thank Marco for um, hosting me and will now um, be looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lena. That was fascinating. And we've got loads of questions already. Um, 
I think they're all anonymous so far. So if anyone who is anonymous and would like to ask their question in person, um, then I think you can go back and edit it and then we can actually um, put, you know, put your name in and then we can ask, call on you live. Otherwise, it's just going to be me asking all these questions. I'm sure we'd like to see some other faces as well. Um, you can also upvote questions that you'd like to see. So we've actually got quite a few here. We might not get through all of them. So if you upvote them, then we know the ones that people are particularly interested in hearing the answers to. Um, so the first one, is um let's have a look okay so from anonymous um vivekananda's conception of prana according to these quotes seems parallel to the concept of prakriti in the three gunas do you see any relation well um as i said uh, that prana his understanding of prana is deeply rooted in indian thought and there is some influence <clears throat> coming in from occultism too and, and the overall outline, he often says that um, his understanding of cosmology is a Sankhya cosmology. So all the terms you are mentioning, Prakriti and the three gunas are um, Sankhya philosophy. And so that was a very highly relevant set for Vivekananda's thought. But I would say he reinterprets reinterpre Sankhya cosmology um, by highlighting prana and akasha, which was not um, relevant, you know, in the Sankhya Karika. And so I hope this, there is a, is a correlation, but um, uh, at, mainly as a background for um, his understanding of cosmology. But I don't think he correlates it very explicitly. Um, so everything what he says about prana is not correlated very explicitly to prakriti and to the three gunas. Although there were interpreters before me who said that <clears throat> the notion of prana is like purusha and the notion of um, akasha matter in all forms is like prakriti, but I think that's too simplistic, simplistic so that's my opinion on that. Yeah, and there is um, an article coming out soon of, so the, actually my first article that explicitly deals with uh, the notion of prana and akasha and I trace this to the yoga vasishta and also to Rama Prasad's occult science of breath so you if you're interested you can read more and it's going to come out in October. Great thank you. Um, so another question we have from Anonymous is um, how influential was the Theosophical Society in shaping our modern conceptions of pranayama and paving the way for Vivekananda's rise to notoriety? Rise to what? Uh, to notoriety, so to his um, fame. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, as I said, um, that I think the Theosophical Society is highly influential in many ways, and um, <clears throat> but not so much in terms. So, so they were influential, influential mostly in terms of disseminating Hatha Yoga texts to a broad public. And so the translation of Hatha Yoga texts into English. So, and in these Hatha Yoga texts, of course, Pranayama is a big theme. So that is an important factor. And they often uh, commented on these translations. So their influence is clearly there. Um, on the other hand, yeah, and then their concepts of Prana, because Theosophy often like has a huge net of cosmological speculation. So, and I think many modern yoga pioneers drew from this huge web of understanding of, for example, prana. Um, but in terms of, they were not very practice oriented. So in, they did not describe various forms of pranayama um, or develop the practice or rarely develop the practice in a specific setting. So that was really the work of the yoga pioneers. So I think uh, the Theosophical Society had an important impact on Vivekananda, but he, there are a lot of factors that where he was um, pushing it much further. And for example, highlighting practice, like he says, like basically practice, don't speculate, practice is enough. I uh, don't think, but play football. So there are statements like this in Vivekananda's thoughts. And that's a very different approach than what the theosophists, theosophists did. Thank you. Um, okay, so another question, also anonymous. Um, when and why did the shift towards more medical and physiological interpretations of pranayama and yoga start to occur? Was this to promote practice in the West? 
No, I don't think it was to promote practice in the West initially because it happened in India with NC Paul in 1851. And it's, it was more the appeal to um, understanding the practice in terms of science because <clears throat> so there is a power element to it. If I can relate to what I do in scientific terms that at that time already raised the cultural capital of pranayama also in India. And, um, and that was the project of sci combining science and religion, right? Um, and then of course there were, so I think NC Paul made a, uh, gave an important base for that. And then um, practitioners like, or modern yoga pioneers like Kuvalyananda and also Sri Yogendra would be another very important example. Um, could reach back to this base that NC Paul has set. And, and one important aspect is correlated to Western discourses because, um, as I said, um, yoga was also um, def defined or um, trying to get to become superior over practices that were practiced or ideas that were practiced in the West. And so by showing that yoga is science and scientifically um, evident, um, it gained also in the West huge um, cultural capital. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay. Um, another anonymous question. Have you looked at the concept of Kaya Kalpa and the use of pranayama to retain good health and even reverse aging? How old is this idea? That's not something I'm familiar with. Is Kaya Kalpa something that means something to you? No, I'm sorry. I can't relate to that. So maybe it's just the, the use of pranayama to retain good health and reverse aging. Is that part of something? Mm -hmm. like Kaya Kalpa. Um, so maybe the, that's some kind of tantric context, but I, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with it, but I will note it down and look it up. That is a great hint. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, okay, so this is uh, upvoted by two people. Um, what specific pranayama practices do you believe Patanjali's Yoga Sutra refers to? Oh, God. <laughs> That's about the most difficult question you could ask. And I'm really not a person to answer it because I think it's highly complex. It's a highly complex question. And <clears throat> I have read, so, so there were, after Patanjali, there are, as you probably know, many commentators who comment on the Yoga Sutra and the first one is Vyasa. Um, and then there is Vajaspati Mishra and then there is Vishnana Pikshu and, and all the medieval commentators and up to the 16th century and later. <clears throat> and I have looked at quite, and also, for example, Shankara commentates on the Yoga Sutra. I've looked at quite a few comments, commentaries in order to figure out your question. <laughs> but there is no, def in my opinion, no definite answer to that because also the commentators interpret various um, thoughts uh, or various practices into their four described practices. And so I'm, I think it's, it's a PhD thesis on its own to talk about that. And that should be done by an Indologist, which I'm not. Great, so a project for somebody else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, could you say a little more on the influence of um, Del Sartism? Is that how, I don't know if I pronounced mm -hmm. it right, on the modern concepts of pranayama? Great question. And so that's more of my <laughs> framework here. Um, so, um, you might have heard about Genevieve, Genevieve Stebbins, whose influence is also described by Ma Mark Singleton in his yoga body. And he gestures towards um, her influential concept of rhythmic breathing. And rhythmic breathing, so Genevieve Stebbins was an American dance artist, one of the most um, influential and prominent ones. Um, and she wrote a, um, a highly influential study, which is called Dynamic Breathing and Harmonic Gymnastics in 1892. And therein she describes rhythmic breathing and she also relates that to cosmological frameworks of the breath of life, of ether, etc., etc. And then, um, and for her, rhythmic breathing um, ultimately induces what she calls soul flight or astral, or she doesn't make it too explicit, but the background is occult, occult and so rhythmic breathing 
in her work is informed by occultism that aimed after astral traveling, so um, out of body experience through rhythmic breathing. And um, rhythmic breathing is a, a phrase, I didn't go into this talk, but it's highly relevant. And it's, for example, um, also used by Vivekananda and almost all yoga pioneers. And the reason I think why they use it is because they had their own concept in pranayama that was contained rhythm, which is, you know, um, counting the three phases of the breath, uh, puraka, rechaka, kumaka, often in a rhythm, for example, one, four, and two. So there was a, already a concept, a welcoming structure that um, welcomed the idea of rhythmic breathing. And, and so I think that's the main influence that we can see from American dance artism on modern yoga's breath cultivation, but there are likely more aspects which I can't go into right now. But you can read my book on pranayama, it's going to <laughs> um, handle, talk about these questions. Okay, we will look forward to that. <laughs> So we have a question here, um, which I think is really asking about the relationship uh, of pranayama to Tao and Qi. So um, is the concept of pranayama as difficult to explain um, like the Tao or Qi, where both terms are extrasensory and metaphysical and being closely connected to the breath? So is there anything you can say about that relationship that you know of? Um, yeah, I can say um, that I can totally see how you correlate these practices and these concepts and and there might there might even be historical links which lie way back in the past of what I'm um, observing here in the pranayama in my pranayama research um, and this could be analyzed in a comparative study too <clears throat> um, and uh, I think the most important thing to, for me to say is I think there can be a link, also a historical um, evident link, um, but it, I think it's more important to see how these concepts, prana and chi, um, are correlated in, in the fields of alternative healing, alternative religion in the new age, how these, set, how these concepts merge and they are often um, viewed as a universalistic kind of a proof that you know every culture would um, handle some kind of concept of the breath of life and so the Indians calls it, called it prana and the Chinese called it chi so that's a, a very relevant discourse in alternative religion and healing practices so you might want to critically examine that too. Okay, yeah, lots more work for other people as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looks like. Um, okay, so we've got time for just one more question and it's also anonymous, everyone's very shy today. So, um, uh, did you, do you know, uh, could you, um, do you know or could you comment on whether Krishnamacharya learnt pranayama from who and how he interpreted it uh, or did he develop his own system? That's a very interesting question. Um, um, I have, I do analyze or I do consider Krishnamacharya's influence on um, or analyze his practice in my PhD thesis, um, but I am not, <clears throat> so far I have not found any sources other than the Yoga Makaranda that he um, probably um, not invented by himself. <clears throat> so he, he refers to certain texts where he gains his knowledge from on the one hand but i don't know um where he who were his teachers at least so far i don't know that and um and the second part of the question was um again martha please um i think we've mostly answered it, it was just like where where did it come from or did he develop it himself so. yeah and and i think yeah i don't think that so um, as far as I have the tech, as far as textual evidence goes, which is my main source of analysis, uh, I have um, I know he he wrote the Yoga Makaranda and he gets explicitly to pranayama, but um, I think so of all the yoga pioneers, if you ask me that I analyze, he is um, the least focusing on innovation. So I, my feeling is 
that he is Paka, and in and also that much of what he 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 describes is relevant in hatha yogic techniques, and his main uh, drive is to or his main thing is to combine a kumbhaka with certain asanas and but there he and that might be innovative but i'm not sure about that so that's um still an open question hmm. so yeah um sounds like there's there's it's a fascinating subject and there's lots more that we could uh, we could talk about there's loads more questions someone's actually just clarified that kaya kalpa is the science of rejuvenation so another term from from britain ayurveda, ayurveda. Um, there we go. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, there's still more questions, but I'm afraid we're, we're out of time. So it's obviously a subject that people are really interested, inspired by, and um, we'll look out for your future publications. Um, so um, first, I just want to thank um, Vicky Adenal, who's been helping with some of the support today. Um, thank you, Vicky, for that. Um, but also, um, thank you so much, uh, Lena, for coming to speak to us. I'm so glad we managed to get you here to, to be able to do that. I'm sorry it couldn't be in in person. No, um, no. <laughs> that was fascinating. And um, I'm going to allow everybody to unmute themselves now. So if you want to also share your thanks, then please give um, Lena a round of applause or say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.